Hey, how's it going? It's Moops of Maelstrom Studios. The modern format has been around for almost a decade now, with new additions to its competitive environment being added every year, whether that be in regular standard sets or sets specifically designed for non-rotating formats. Sure, there were times where some of the cards released had to be banned, but for the most part, modern has greatly improved from these additions. But let's say that you've gotten bored with modern. Maybe you're not really liking the fact that Uro Piles is just dominating the metagame. Do you want a new experience without breaking the bank? Well, allow me to introduce you to this little variant format called Modern Highlander. So, to get the boring stuff out of the way, Modern Highlander is a competitive Highlander variant, meaning only one copy of a card is allowed in a deck, with 60 cards in the main and 15 in the side. All modern legal sets are allowed, but cards are curated via a points list rather than a ban list. Which means Oko's back again! Ah! <clears throat> Decks can also only have five points worth of cards, so you won't be able to just play all the most busted cards in a deck and win. And I think that covers all of what you really need to know about the format. It's still relatively new, and the meta is slowly being developed, so it's kind of like Pioneer right now in the sense that people are just playing whatever they think is good and seeing what works. We've got Twin, Dark Depths Combo, Birthing Pod, Uro Piles, Jund, and now I'm throwing my hat into the ring with Rakdos Kitty Carnage. So what exactly is Kitty Carnage? Well, it's basically just the Lurus Aggro deck that's currently a modern, but transferred over to Modlander. This means we run low-cost creatures that benefit from us casting multiple spells in a turn, and aim to beat down our opponents before they even know what hit them. So why play red-black instead of red-blue? That's a good question, and you honestly could play either. But I chose to play red-black for two reasons. Reason number one, I get to play a kitty cat. Reason number two, black gives us a bunch of options when it comes to its spells whether that be in the form of discard or spot removal. There's so much that we get to take advantage of, but I'll touch on that later when we get to it. For now, let's jump right into the list, starting with the creatures. So with most of our creatures, all we really plan to do with them is go face. However, our creatures differ in how they go about hitting face. We run Abbot of Carol Keep, Kiln Fiend, Monastery Swift Spear, and Soul Mage as creatures that can benefit from us playing multiple spells in a turn. They seem weak on their own, but couple them with a few one-cost spells, and suddenly they grow into huge threats. It's also worth mentioning that Soulscar Mage is coupled nicely with all the red removal we have in the deck, since its ability gets around indestructible, and can actually soften blows that would be dealt to us by our opponent's creatures. Abbott is really good at keeping up the momentum by allowing us to play the top card of our deck. We don't want to run out of steam, otherwise our opponents can capitalize on that and neutralize any of our threats, so Abbott helps in that sense. Another card that somewhat fits in this category is Young Pyromancer. This 2 one for 2 can steal so many games just by playing our deck the way we intended to. We can make an insane amount of elementals over the course of a few turns, which can serve as extra damage or expendable chump blockers. Either way, if you can get them on the board, keep them there for as long as possible. Some of our creatures benefit not from casting spells, but by having spells in the graveyard. Deathrite Shaman, Dreadhorde Arcanist, Grim Lava Mancer, and Magmatic Channeler make up this ragtag group. Deathrite Shaman was banned in Modern and Legacy for a reason. This card is absurdly powerful in this deck. We not only get to benefit from our graveyard, but our opponent's graveyard as well, whether that be from exiling a fetch land to generate some mana, or exiling spells to deal some damage. Dreadhorde Arcanist can not only give us some repeated value from our graveyard, but can also buff our prowess creatures at the same time. A lot of our spells are one cost in this deck, so we can ensure that if a spell ever hits the yard, it'll come back eventually. Grim Lava Mancer ensures that we can utilize our graveyard, even if we don't have our kitty cat with us. By exiling two cards from the graveyard, we can have a repeated shock targeting whatever we like, which can come in handy if blockers are ever a problem. Magmatic Channeler is a recent addition from Zendikar Rising, and oh boy is it good in this deck. Not only does it become a 4-4 once there are enough instants and sorceries in the yard, but it can keep up the momentum at the cost of discarding a card. This is honestly such a boon for this deck, and I'm expecting to see more of it in the months to come. To ensure that our deck doesn't run out of gas, we run some ways to draw cards off our creatures. Both Dark Confidant and Rick's Mahdi Reveler serve as ways to get some guaranteed card draw. Dark Confidant is the most expensive card in the deck, but thankfully was reprinted in Double Masters, so the price has fallen down to a manageable $26. If you're really tight on cash and don't want to run it, I would recommend running Paint Sierra in this slot instead. It essentially does the same thing as Dark Confidant, but you can control when you want to draw the extra card. It's also way cheaper at $0.22. Cents. Either way, Dark Confidant or Paint Seer can get us a good card draw at a reasonable price. Most of our deck is made up of 1-2 to two cost cards anyway, so it's not like we're gonna be taking that much damage. Rick's Reveler, on the other hand, rewards us for going face by essentially letting us draw 3 cards if we play our deck right. And even in the worst case scenario, we get to loot with it at 2 mana. 
We just have to pay attention to the fact that it'll cost more to cast if we want to draw three. Lastly, we run some general beatdown creatures to ensure that we'll get in some cheap damage. Goblin Guide, Kari Zev, Zergo Bellstriker, and Kroxa are all cheap ways to ensure that life total across the table goes down. Goblin Guide is the OG red beatdown creature, being a 2-2 with haste for only one red mana. Can it potentially give our opponent a land? Yeah, yeah it can. But do we care? <laughs> no. Zergo is the next best thing, being able to dash in for two mana if we ever need an immediate attack, or be played as a one mana 2-2 if we can wait a turn. Kari Zev flies onto the field with not only just Menace and First Strike, but also a monkey. Now, it doesn't really matter if the monkey dies because she can just make a new one every time she attacks, which is really good when you consider that she has Menace. And then we have Kroxa. Oh, Kroxa, you abomination of nature, you. For two mana, you not only get a discard out of your opponent, but you also get a threat that you can bring back should the game start to slow down. Kroxa not only eats away at your opponent's hand when you cast them, but every time he attacks as well. And once the opponent runs out of cards, that 3 damage will start to add up. So those are all of the creatures that we run in the deck. They all do a multitude of things, most important of all being going face, but they wouldn't be able to do what they do without our spells. Smooth transition, I know. I'm going to be dividing up the spells that we run in a similar fashion to how I divided up the creatures, starting off with our card draw. Having a way to draw cards off our spells works wonders in this deck, because it not only lets us keep drawing into more gas, but it can enable a lot of our creatures in this deck. So we run Cling to Dust, Cremate, Expedite, Faithless Looting, Manamorphos, Mishra's Bobble, and Smuggler's Copter as ways to ensure that our deck's engine stays running. I run Cremate and Cling to Dust as main board ways to deal with anything our opponent might be trying to pull with their graveyard. Since this is Modlander, I'm expecting to run into some graveyard shenanigans, whether it be a Lands deck, a Dredge deck, Reanimator, Uro in general, you get the idea. Plus, even if it isn't a good card for the matchup, we can just pay one mana to essentially cantrip off of it. That doesn't sound like a bad deal. The same applies to Expedite, although Expedite giving haste can sometimes come in clutch if we need to sling in for those last few points of damage with something like a Kiln Fiend or even Magmatic Channeler. Faithless Looting is just a good way to draw cards for this deck. We not only go two cards deep, but sometimes we don't even care about what we discard because we just bring it back with Lurus, but more on that later. Manamorphos and Mishra's Bubble are essentially just free draw spells that can trigger prowess on our creatures, although they are a bit delayed. Bubble only draws you a card at the beginning of the next upkeep, while Manamorphos is two mana, meaning you can't really play it turn one. That being said, these cards are still really good in the deck. Manamorphos can help us fix our mana if we really need it, and Mishra's Bubble can give us vital information about what our opponent is up to. And then we get to Smuggler's Copter. Really, I should have put this in the creature section, but it technically isn't a creature. Either way, Smuggler's Copter is good at both getting in damage and drawing us some cards. We run some burn in the deck as well, because let's face it, if you're gonna be playing red, you know that you're gonna be running some burn spells. Fork Bolt, Incinerate, Lava Dart, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Strike, and Seal of Fire make up all our direct damage spells. There isn't really that much to differentiate between them. Obviously, Lava Dart is meant for all the X ones that'll be running around, and Seal of Fire combos really well with Lurus, but they really are just there to deal damage, simple as that. Next up is our discard suite, which we run Inquisition of Kozilek and Thoughtseize. Both pretty much serve the same purpose, with Inquisition being able to discard low cost things, and Thoughtseize being able to discard any non land card at the cost of 2 life. If you feel Thoughtseize is too much out of your budget, then may I recommend Blackmail as a budget alternative. The thing about Blackmail is that you can actually get the option to discard land cards, but is slighted by the fact your opponent gets to choose what to show you. You could also run Raven's Crime as a way to ensure that even if you draw a land, you'll still be able to make use out of it. Sure, it once again gives your opponent the choice of what to discard, but it's repeatable, which works wonders with the prowess creatures that we run. Outside of our companion Lurus, we do run some additional ways to get back our creatures with Claim to Fame and Unearth. Both serve the exact same purpose of getting back any creature in her deck, but Unearth is slightly better because it can actually get back Lurus if she ever hits the graveyard, and has cycling to boot. This doesn't make Claim to Fame obsolete, however, since we can cast its fame sign from the graveyard later on in the game, once again triggering prowess and buffing a creature. Don't forget that it also gives haste to that creature, so targeting an attacker that was just cast can spell the end for your opponent. Now let's move on to what Red Black is really known for, its kill spells. Outside of our burn spells, which already serve as a way to kill creatures, we run a Braid, Blood Chief's Thirst, Dread Boar, Fatal Push, and Terminate as cards that, for the most part, just delete a creature off the field. Blood Chief's Thirst is a new addition from Zendikar Rising, serving as sort of a pseudo-Fatal Push. We can kick it also if we ever need to get rid of a creature late game, but if we've ever reached that point, then there might be more important things that you have to worry about. I also want to specifically talk about a braid and how it's a very useful card, not only for killing three toughness creatures, but also serving as main board artifact removal. 
there's one thing that I know will be prevalent in Moundlander, it's definitely going to be artifacts. We've got Birthing Pod, Arkham's Astrolabe, Umazawa's Jite, Batter Skull, the Protection Swords, freaking Chalice of the Void. If there's one way to shut down this deck, it's Chalice. Like I said earlier, a lot of our spells have a converted mana cost of 1, so if our opponent can play this early game, we're fucked if we don't find a way to remove it. A Braid is super useful at getting rid of Chalice, mainly because it has a converted mana cost of 2, thus getting around Chalice. Apart from that, the rest of the removal package is nothing too special. Lastly, we get to our flex spells. What do I mean by flex spells? Well, they're spells that can do different things depending on what we want them to do. Collective Brutality, Inscription of Ruin, and Call Against Command are all spells that have different modes and can do different things, whether that be direct damage, flat out removal, discard effects, artifact removal, or creature recursion. They are all powerful cards in any given situation, and even though they are a bit highly costed at 2-3 mana, I'm more than happy to include them. Uh, oh yeah, lands. Um, uh, we need those. Uh, there's nothing really special here. It's about as predictable as you'd expect for a deck like this. We run 20 lands, which are made up of 7 duels, 12 basics, and 1 fetch land. That's right, we're running Bloodstained Mire. It's a good way to trigger Fatal Push's Revolt ability if need be, but if you don't have the money to buy it, you can easily replace it with a Fabled Passage or a Mountain if you'd like to. Fabled Passage can trigger Revolt and thin your deck, but the land will most likely come into play tapped, and that's not what you want in an aggressive deck. Still, there are options out there. Now that I've talked about the main deck, let's move on to the sideboard. Angras Rampage and Searing Blood are there as more general removal, with Rampage being able to destroy different kinds of things, and Searing Blood exiling the creature it kills. Cleansing Wildfire and Molten Rain are ways for our deck to deal with problematic lands that might hit the field, whether that be Field of the Dead, Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, you get the idea. Deathmark and Eliminate are more specific kinds of removal, with Deathmark only targeting green or white creatures, and Eliminate being an upcosted Blood Cheese Thirst. Against control decks, we bring in Blightning, Duress, Fry, and Guttural Response as extra ways to ensure that they don't have any fun. Blightning and Duress are ways to get spells out of our opponent's hand, with Blightning adding a little extra damage onto itself. Fry is there just to get rid of problematic creatures or planeswalkers, mainly Jace, Oko, Teferi, Narset, you get the idea. Guttural Response is there as a way to counter blue spells. Because we're red-black, we don't really have ways to get around our opponent countering our shit. Guttural Response is a card that I haven't seen get a lot of attention, and it can serve as a kind of gotcha moment in the same way Mana Tithe does. Dire Fleet Daredevil and Soul Guide Lantern serve as ways for us to fuck with our opponent's graveyard. Daredevil can turn our opponent's graveyard into a resource for us to exploit, while Soul Guide is there just to delete cards from our opponent's graveyard. Keyword there being our opponent. We still very much want to keep our graveyard around, otherwise we just play Relic of Progenitus instead. And lastly, Harsh Mentor and Rolling Vortex serve as general stacks pieces that punish our opponent for doing general things, whether that be gaining life, casting things for free, or using activated abilities. And finally, that leaves us with Lurus. Lurus is the whole reason we are red-black instead of going red-blue, and it's for that one piece of text on her. The ability to cast permanent spells from our graveyard with converted mana cost 2 or less. Now this? This is an engine. Being able to replay our threats even if they die is huge, and it ensures that constant pressure is kept on our opponent. And the keyword in that block of text is permanent. So that means we can replay our Seal of Fire, we can replay our Smuggler's Copter, we can replay Bobble. You see why it's worth running Lurus? Of course, there is the possibility that our opponent kills Lurus, but we have ways to bring her back to keep the cycle going. So yeah, that's Red Black Kitty Carnage for you. As of the filming of this video, if you wanted to go out and buy all the pieces, it would set you back around $200, which is much more reasonable than going out to pay god knows how much standard decks cost nowadays. But if you want to upgrade the deck, then I can help you out. Now you could either go two ways, you can stick with Red Black, or you can go full Mardu. Staying Red Black makes you less susceptible to Blood Moon effects, since you're only going to be in two colors, and it is cheaper to upgrade, but going Mardu gives you access to a lot of powerful cards. You can cut Lurus to run Monastery Mentor, Lingering Souls, Seeker of the Way, Seasoned Pyromancer, not to mention all the powerful sideboard options you get by running white. Then again, this pathway is much more expensive since you're going to have to be buying a lot of duels and fetch lands. Thankfully, the enemy colored fetches are going to be reprinted in Modern Horizons 2, so that's something to look forward to. So it's up to you. You can either stay red black if you want a cheaper upgrade path, or go full Mardu if you want to have more options available to you. And with that, that ends our show. I hope you enjoyed the video because I sure as hell had a lot more fun with this one. I went a bit out of my comfort zone with regards to editing and whatnot, so I hope it shows. If you have any suggestions for the deck, whether that be cards to include or to throw out, let me know in the comments. Again, thank you so much for watching and, well, see ya.